sixth chapter, beginning at the 20th verse. Let us listen again for the word of God. Then he looked up at his disciples and said, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who are hungry now, for you will be filled. Blessed are you who weep now, for you will laugh. Blessed are you when people hate you, when they exclude you, revile you, and defame you on account of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy, for surely your reward is great in heaven. For that is what their ancestors did to the prophets. But woe to you who are rich, for you have received your consolation. Woe to you who are full now, for you will be hungry. Woe to you who are laughing now, for you will mourn and weep. Woe to you when all speak well of you, for that is what their ancestors did to the false prophets. But I say to you that listen, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who who abuse you. If anyone strikes you on the cheek, offer the other also. And from anyone who takes away your coat, do not withhold even your shirt. Give to everyone who begs from you. And if anyone takes away your goods, do not ask for them again. Do to others as you would have them do to you. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Thanks be to God. The other day I was leafing through a catalog and I saw a plaque that caught my attention. It said, I do yoga, I burn candles, I drink green tea, and I still want to smack someone. <laughs> now I hate to admit it, but those words really resonated with me. In fact, I kind of wanted to smack the creators of the lectionary for choosing this text for All Saints Sunday. It's just too hard. Too hard on so many levels. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who abuse you. Woe to you who are rich. Hey, you lectionary people, don't you realize November is stewardship month? This is not the time to piss off rich people. And for heaven's sakes, we are two days away from the most contentious election in my living memory. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. I think not. But we're stuck with this text. So my next complaint, why couldn't it have been Matthew's version of the Beatitudes? Where it's about the poor in spirit, not just the poor. Where it's about hunger for righteousness, not for real food for an empty stomach. Luke's version is so stark. We can't weasel out by spiritualizing what he's talking about. Right. Plus, Matthew's version, Matthew's version, doesn't have these corresponding woes. Woe to you who are rich, for you have received your consolation. Woe to you who are full now, for you will be hungry. Woe to you who are laughing now, for you will mourn and weep. Is Jesus threatening us? Some read the word.
words, woe to you as a curse, but I don't think Jesus is cursing us. I think he's stating a fact that we just don't want to acknowledge. He's reminding those of us who seek to secure our lives through the pursuit of money that it will not protect us from the ravages of life. Jesus is speaking to the rich, reminding them that their money will not prevent them from losing their loved ones to cancer or old age. Reminding them, you can't take it with you. Jesus in Luke's Gospel is relentless in pointing out that the ways human society organizes itself into haves and have-nots skews our perceptions of who and what is of value, skews our perceptions of what counts as having enough, causes us to demonize those who do not have Jesus is speaking words of blessing to the poor, the hungry, the mourners, because he wants them to know that their value is not measured by their income or their lack of it. Their lives and all of our lives are secured by our status as beloved children of God. You see, when God created the world, God made enough so that everyone and everything could flourish. Enough so everyone could look upon it and with God say, this is very good. Yes. Richard Swanson says that his grandmother used to say, God made enough for everyone's need, but not enough for everyone's greed. God made enough for everyone's need, but not enough for everyone's greed. Maybe Jesus' grandmother said it to him, too. <laughs> it's only when we understand and embrace the truth that our lives are secured by our status as children of God, not by our level of income that we can be set free from a disordered life of crippling anxiety that leads to greed. Mm. A few weeks ago, when Pastor Lance's sermon led us into an impromptu prayer circle where we shouted out our need for justice, that cry for justice was rooted in the belief that when God created the world, God made enough that everyone and everything could flourish. Justice is rooted in God's loving creation of our world. Jesus' blessings, counterbalanced by woes in Luke's Gospel, seems to reflect this idea of justice. But then, why does he continue with stuff like love your enemies, do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Turn the other cheek. Give not only your coat, but also your shirt. That doesn't sound like justice. That sounds like becoming a doormat. That's the kind of stuff that has led church people to be on the wrong side of domestic abuse cases. Preach. Preach. Jesus' words about turning the other cheek and giving up your shirt along with your coat seems demeaning in the extreme. But Jesus isn't calling victims to roll over and play dead. It's very hard for us to see that because it sounds like Jesus is telling victims to be quiet and keep taking it. But New Testament scholar Walter Wing helps us to see something far different. Wink sees Jesus' words as a form of nonviolent resistance to oppression. Now, this is tricky because we have to know something about the culture in which Jesus lived. In the culture of first century Palestine, a person's left hand was used for what we might call, well, bathroom functions. 
I know it's not pleasant to think about this, but it meant that you would never strike a person with your left hand. If you were superior to another person, you would strike them with the back of your right hand. Never with the palm of your hand, because that would mean you saw them as an equal. So now this is the picture that Jesus is painting. If someone strikes you on the cheek, it will most likely be with the back of their hand. Remember, Jesus is talking to victims here. So your oppressors will not see you as equal. If you turn your face to the side, you force your oppressor to see you as an equal. For even your oppressor won't use his left hand. Some things simply aren't done. Jesus wants us to see an almost comical situation here. The oppressor's hand begins to swing, but is caught in midair because he doesn't want to treat you as an equal by striking you with the palm of his hand. The same humorous resistance comes in giving up your shirt when your oppressor asks for your coat. Now this isn't a case of having an old, taking an old coat to the winter coat drop. Jesus is talking about something completely different. It's likely in Jesus' time that if someone asked for your coat, it would have been in repayment for a debt. You owe your oppressor something, and since you have no land and very little money, your oppressor asks for your coat. Now, there were very clear restrictions regarding the payment of debts. You could not leave a debtor naked at sundown, no matter what he or she owed. It was simply not done. It was against every sense of decency and good order. So Jesus sets up another strategy of resistance. If they ask for your coat, give them your shirt too. Then you'll be standing there half naked, and they'll be forced to deal with this new reality. No, no, they'll say, I don't want your shirt, put it back on. And they might be so disarmed that they'll return your coat as well. Jesus is not telling people to remain victims, but to find new ways to resist evil. Do not receive the humiliation intended, is his message. Do not receive the humiliation intended, because you are blessed. Jesus proclaims it, and neither poverty, nor hunger, nor mourning, nor being hated can change that. God created you, and what God created, God declared good. Because God declares all his creatures good, then do to others as you would have them do to you. It really is a simple formula, yet it takes a lifetime to learn. The saints whom we asked to stand with us at the beginning of our service weren't all well-behaved folks. They were folks who lived in the same messy world that we live in. Author Michael Malone has a character in his book who's an Episcopal priest. At one point, the priest reflects on what makes a saint. What makes a saint? If stars are the light, then I'd say saints are the people the light shines through. Not just the famous saints, because the famous ones are stars, too. But the everyday saints around us in the world, light shines through them and illuminates what they see. The light just goes right through them to what they love so that we can see its beauty. They don't get in the way because they're looking too. Saints are the people the light shines through. Saints are those who in every generation show us God's love affair with humanity. When I look out from this pulpit, I see saints in this church. You know how to give. 
you know how to serve. The saints I have known here, whether poor or rich, weeping or laughing, hungry or full, have somehow pointed me and us to God because you have looked to the love of God and the light of that love shines through you. Do you see it? Do you see that love that shines through this magnificent communion of saints? Do you see that love through one another? I do.